Vigilante justice is back, baby. Say it with your chest. I'm vengeance. At least in Florida. So this story and situation starts last week where you have 32-year-old Brandon Joseph Harris. He allegedly breaks into multiple homes throughout Wednesday. According to police, Brandon's been on their radar since he was 13, having 17 arrests since then, serving six years in prison for a home invasion. And so on this day in question, Brandon's being chased by the police. He's hopping over fences, going through people's property, and eventually entering a person's home who has a gun. With the homeowner firing at Harris, who jumps out of a window, straight into the arms of police. Right, Brandon's happy he didn't get shot, but he still goes to jail. But all of that is just the setup for the story. Because what everyone has been focused on is the next day at the press conference, you have Sheriff Bob Johnson say it. We don't know what homeowner, which homeowner shot at him. Um, I guess they think that they did something wrong, which they did not. If somebody's breaking in your house, you're more than welcome to shoot them in Santa Rosa County. We prefer that you do, actually. Um, so whoever that was, you're not in trouble. Come see us. We have a gun safety class we put on every other Saturday, and if you take that, you'll shoot a lot better, and hopefully you'll save the taxpayers money. Yeehaw, motherfucker! With it sounding like the sheriff being like, don't feel bad you shot at him, feel bad you missed. You know, this clip goes viral over the weekend, a lot of people going, wait, what the fuck? Did the sheriff just tell people to shoot and kill people to save the county money? With that ultimately leading to Sheriff Bob Johnson apologize. No, he didn't. Instead, Johnson going on Fox News and essentially said, I said what I said. Well, you know, I always talk like that. I, I ran on the fact that I'm a cop, not a politician. And I'll tell you right now, you know, if somebody breaks in your house in San Rosa County and you shoot and kill them, the chances of them reoffending after that are zero. And we like those odds. So um, in San Rosa County, if you break into a house, you roll the dice. Plus earlier saying he broke into one house and the homeowner fired at him unfortunately did not hit him. It also feels at times like the interviewer is just egging him on. Well, you are being tough and you are standing up for the good guys and not the bad guys. Now, all of that said, to be fair to Johnson, a number of lawyers have said, you know, he's not wrong. What he is saying is legally accurate. Right? Florida's stand your ground law lets people use deadly force to prevent a forcible felony, including home invasion, even if the intruder doesn't have a weapon. But uh, a number of those experts were reportedly aghast at kind of how brazen and, and joyful <laughs> Johnson was. But the president of the Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers tell NPR. It's wildly irresponsible because it essentially encourages people to use deadly force without giving it more consideration. There's often times that somebody is not an imminent threat to you. With another lawyer adding, for Johnson to put that notion in people's head could lead to a parent shooting their daughter as she sneaks home late at night. Or imagine a teenager who asks his friend to come on over and sneak into the house. Kids make mistakes. And to that, I, I kind of see the point they're making, but this is, this is not the first time, but it may be a rarity. I think I kind of agree with Florida man. If you break into my home where my wife and my children live, the only thing telling your side of the story is gonna be the camera footage and your cold body. You're equating accidental shootings about kids sneaking in and some motherfucker who has a history of home invasions breaking into someone's property. Where the situation we are talking about is an active police pursuit. And if anything, I feel bad for the homeowner for being put into the position where they have to make that choice. Like, yeah, it is possible that Sheriff Brad Johnson, it gets his dick hard to take the life from a man, but at the end of the day, the, the core of the story that we're talking about is a homeowner's right to defend themselves if someone enters their property. And while tons of situations can have different factors, nine times out of 10, I'm gonna sympathize with the homeowner. And then let's talk about massive and concerning news when it comes to digital content and ads. Right, in general, ads are a big part of digital content, whether you're reading something, listening to something, watching something. Hell, even recently, Netflix is like, do we need to start playing ads? But the focus of this story is that we're starting to see a concerning trend for platforms and the creators on them, which could change what those creators do, thus impacting their viewers. Versus some of the things we're seeing. Last week, you had the CEO of Snap describing their first quarter as challenging and saying that the company provided a weak sales forecast for the second quarter, which you might say, okay, well that's snap. But then you've got the king of online ads, YouTube announcing, oh shit, we missed the mark this quarter. Before announcing their earnings and revenue, YouTube was expected to go up 25% in ad dollars for the quarter. Instead though, only hitting 14%, which you could say, hey, that's still a positive, but that is a concerning miss. According to Street Account, YouTube advertising revenue is supposed to come in at $7.51 billion, instead only hitting $6.87 billion. With Paul Verna, an analyst at Insider Intelligence, blaming it on increased competition from social video platforms like TikTok and a plethora of premium entertainment services led by Disney+. Plus. So, personally, I do want to say, I think this could just be a bump in the road. YouTube has been really focused on YouTube shorts, and on the daily, they bring in 30 billion views, but the monetization for it's just not there. But if they are able to figure out how to monetize that well, I mean, one, 
that's a huge influx of cash. But also too, it gives them a major advantage over TikTok who essentially just kind of throws table scraps at their top creators. And then today you had Twitch announcing some major potential changes. With it starting today, thanks to a Bloomberg report saying that people familiar with the matter claim that Twitch is looking at switching up how it pays top talent. A move the outlet says would boost its profit, but would also risk alienating some of its biggest stars. And among the main potential changes are them adding incentives for streamers to run more ads, as well as a proposal that would cut down on how much of a subscription fee would go to the creator. Noting that the staff is considering cutting the subscription revenue pie for the top echelon of streamers to 50% from 70%. Also weighing the options of creating different tiers and offering to allow creators out of their exclusivity contracts so they could stream in places like YouTube. With Bloomberg saying that we may see these changes soon, right? They want that big summer money. And with ads, especially ads that stop you from being able to consume the content being so negatively received, we've seen a lot of big reactions from top creators. With the likes of one of their biggest streamers, Hassan Piker tweeting, when I negotiated my contract, I knew this was coming and wanted to lock in one minute of ads per hour. Twitch still served pre-rolls because it wasn't three minutes. Love Twitch, but it seems they're moving away from content creators to fix their profits. Adding nearly my entire revenue comes from subscribers who elect to give me $5 a month. Twitch doesn't consider the 50-50 split it takes from smaller creators in that process profitable enough. That's wild. Hate to say it, but Twitch only makes moves like this because they think there is no competitor in the live streaming space. Mixer is dead, Facebook is a black hole for relevance, and YouTube is too big to care about live streaming and too slow to change. They threw some money at some creators and stopped. Also the likes of Jacksepticeye keeping it short and simple, saying what a joke, makes it worse for everyone except Twitch themselves. Pokimane also chiming in, saying that Twitch should just implement ads that don't directly interfere with a stream, sidebar, picture in picture, underlay, etc. And adding, I understand advertisers are essential to make a platform profitable, but intervening with the viewer's experiences and how they should go about it. Emma Langevin tweeting, they should just straight up tell us that they hate us and don't care. And keep in mind, this is just a little bit of the flood of reactions we've seen, which I think is a really important thing to note, and it makes me think of today's sponsor, Manscaped. I'm kidding. You know, with all this, I did find something interesting, and that was that freelance reporter, Zach Busey, he seemingly had some insight here, adding, what's worse is that allegedly the people who have been hired by Twitch to represent creators and be their voice at the table have apparently been at the forefront of saying that creators don't really deserve to dictate subsplit, and adding, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know precisely what is being said or planned, but if you haven't already, I would strongly recommend you start working on your YouTube and TikTok, set up a Patreon, fan house, or Ko-Fi, maybe even a fourth wall. But also at the same time, you have some saying, you know, there are pros and cons here, saying no exclusivity is way overdue, good to see that, but also saying a majority of ad revenue should always go to creators. I'd say expand other video formats to help growth instead of inundating viewers with more ads on live stream. But with all of that said, I do want to pass a question off to you. What are your thoughts here, whether it be Twitch specifically or ads in general right now? And that question is for everyone, even the 35% of you that use ad blockers. <laughs> From that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Manscaped, the leading brand for men's grooming and hygiene solutions. Do you know that one man every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? In fact, it's the most common form of cancer among men ages 15 to 35. Well, in honor of Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, Manscaped has partnered up with the Testicular Cancer Society to create the first limited edition purple TCS Lawnmower 4.0 collectible trimmer. While you're down there trimming away with a lawnmower, waterproof, cordless, skin safe trimmer, it's the perfect time to remember to do simple at home self checks and feel confident that you're taking the time to care for yourself in the process. Shave them to save them, if you will. And with the release of the purple TCS trimmer, Manscaped is also donating $50,000 to TCS to help those impacted by testicular cancer. So to purchase or for more info on how you can perform simple routine self checks at home, visit manscaped.com slash TCS. And right now you can get 20% off plus free shipping when you use my code PhilTCS at checkout. That's code PhilTCS for 20% off plus free shipping off your entire order at manscaped.com. And then we need to talk about what the fuck is going on with Britain's parliament. And I know the Brits watching are like, yeah, which thing, Phil? Gonna need you to be a little more specific. Right, so what we're talking about is a series of events that started unfolding last week. With a report by the Sunday Times finding that 56 members of parliament, including three senior ministers, are facing allegations of sexual misconduct after being reported to a parliamentary watchdog. So far, pretty normal, right? Unfortunately, not many people are surprised that sexism is a thing. But then it gets worse with a few days later, the Daily Mail reporting that at least one anonymous conservative law maker made a disgusting claim about Labour Deputy Leader Angela Rayner, saying that she likes to put Boris Johnson, quote, off his stride by crossing and uncrossing her legs while he's talking, comparing it to a scene in the film Basic Instinct and adding, she knows she can't compete with Boris's Oxford Union debating training, but she has other skills which he lacks, leading to a wave of people denouncing the article, even some conservatives with Johnson saying, I have to say, I thought it was the most appalling load of uh, a sexist, misogynist tripe, and I uh, immediately got in touch with Angela and, uh, and we had a uh, a, a very friendly uh, exchange and, you know, if we ever find who is responsible for it, we'll, well, I don't know what we'll do with them, but 
Well, they'll be the terrors of the earth. And just like that, the patriarchy was systematically dismantled. Except it wasn't, and then it kind of got worse. Because last night, conservatives held a meeting in which female lawmakers shared their own experiences of sexual harassment by their colleagues, with around a dozen of them reportedly doing so, one even crying and another MP calling it bloodletting, others demanding that action be taken against three specific cabinet ministers accused of being sex pests, with things like one woman recalling an incident where a male lawmaker saw his female colleague in a knee-length leather skirt and said, that's a nice outfit, what do you do for your day job? Also, there was an allegation that an unnamed conservative MP was watching porn on his phone inside the House of Commons, this while on the front bench and sitting right fucking next to a female minister. So you have the chief party whip investigating the claim, an office spokesperson saying this behavior is wholly unacceptable and action will be taken. And unfortunately, this whole shitstorm, it's not a new thing for parliament or even conservatives. Right, just earlier this month, one of their lawmakers, Imram Ahmad Khan, he was found guilty of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old boy and resigned. Though, incredibly important to note, the problems cross party lines, with there being a 2018 report that found that one in five people working in parliament either experienced sexual harassment themselves or they witnessed something inappropriate the year prior. So you know, a, a little bit concerning. And well, of course, I want to know everyone's thoughts, especially to the Brits watching. What are your thoughts on this? And then we've got to talk about the public flogging of House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy we're seeing right now because he made the cardinal sin of privately not being a crazy person for three minutes. So if you haven't heard, the New York Times just published audio from a private conversation four days after the insurrection, where McCarthy expressed concern about far-right members inciting violence and even openly voicing support for censoring them on Twitter. And these recordings are incredibly significant because it shows Republicans and Republican leadership genuinely concerned about their far-right members and acknowledging that members of their party played a role in stoking the violence we saw on January 6th. Also emphasizing the vast difference between what these people, specifically McCarthy, said behind closed doors and how they downplayed and ignored the actions of their members in public. And one of the most notable elements of this story is you have McCarthy and others specifically saying names, with the two most focused on being Mo Brooks and Matt Gates. Tension is too high, the country is too crazy. I do not want to look back and think we caused something or we missed something and someone got hurt. Um, I don't want to play politics with any of that. With McCarthy and others talking about how Gates had gone on TV to attack multiple Republicans for being anti-Trump after January 6th, and especially expressing concern over his targeting of Liz Cheney, who was a member of the leadership team and was already facing threats. Others on the call also noting that Brooks had spoken at the rally before the insurrection where he made incendiary remarks and many have viewed as direct calls to violence. McCarthy saying these actions have to stop, adding that he would call Gates and have others also call him to tell him this is serious shit and to cut this out. To which Representative Steve Scalise, the second ranking House Republican, responded. It's potentially illegal what he's doing. Well, he's putting people in jeopardy, and he, he doesn't need to be doing this. We, we saw what people would do in the Capitol, um, you know, and these people came prepared and with everything else. Well, that's obviously pretty fucking wild. It's also not where it stops. The people on the call also mentioned incendiary remarks from others, including representatives Louis Gohmert, Barry Moore, and Lauren Boebert, with Cheney specifically flagging Boebert as a security risk, noting that she had tweeted out incredibly sensitive information about the movements of top leaders like Nancy Pelosi during the insurrection, with McCarthy at one point saying, Our members have got to start paying attention to what they say too, and you can't put up with that type of And then after people on the call read some especially wild tweets from Representative Moore, he added, Can't they take their Twitter accounts away too? And beyond that, these newly published recordings come just days after McCarthy flat out lied. The Times had come out with a report saying that McCarthy told members after the insurrection that he would call Trump and urge him to resign. McCarthy initially calling the report totally false and wrong, which the Times was like, I bet, with him shortly after that getting permission from their source to publish the audio where he can literally be heard saying that. With McCarthy for his part trying to spin the story, claiming that his denial was still true because he never actually followed through and told Trump to resign. You know, the classic, I'm a lying pussy defense. And what's been really interesting with this story are the reactions because I mean, Trump himself. Just this week, and reportedly said he supports McCarthy for speaker, according to at least one Republican member. Though on Friday, the former president didn't give a direct answer when asked by the Wall Street Journal, but he made it clear he didn't like the tape, but he's happy about McCarthy's reversal. But that doesn't necessarily mean that will be Trump's opinion moving forward. And I say that because McCarthy has received a ton of backlash from the far right of his party, and now more and more. With numerous people coming out and slamming him, multiple people expressing their hesitancy about their support for him as a Republican leader in the House, saying they couldn't trust him. And possibly one of the most important conservative voices last night, Tucker Carlson called McCarthy a puppet of the Democrat Party, with Gates saying of McCarthy, this is the behavior of weak men, not leaders. And so this ends up being a situation that's gonna be fascinating to watch of does Trump now fall in line? Does he now have to play catch up? Because to me, Tucker Carlson isn't news. He is an opinion maker. He does less to inform people about what's actually happening in the world, and he's informing them of what their opinions are. When it comes to conservatives, he is very good at that. And so it'll be especially interesting to see how Tucker's influence on the conservative base will affect long 
lawmakers who have been trying to support McCarthy. Right? For example, reportedly several people who attended today's House Republican conference meeting said the minority leader delivered a speech defending himself and talking about winning back the House in November without being met by a standing ovation. So the question becomes, okay, is that everything or are these big, big voices going to have an impact? Because if the past is any indication, they can be very, very persuasive. But hey, time will tell. And in the meantime, I'd love to know your thoughts. What do you think is going to happen with McCarthy? But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. And whether it be just for this last story or anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.